Greetings. I want to uh, go back over a, a memory uh, from, from uh, when I was young and uh, attending uh, Orthodox Jewish services at, uh, in Fairfield, Connecticut. And on the Sabbath uh, afternoon, uh, the, you know, men would get together, as is the uh, appropriate custom uh, in, in Orthodox Judaism. On the Sabbath afternoon, we would get together for an afternoon service. And before the evening service, as we were going to say goodbye to Shabbat, uh, there, there, in the in late afternoon, we would come together for the third meal, the third Sabbath meal which is traditionally eaten uh, uh, together by the men in the synagogue and it is accompanied by singing and by uh, teaching, by instruction. So as we're sitting around the table, uh, there were a couple of Jews from, uh, who had come from Egypt and the rest of us did not have that kind of background. And the rest of us, none of us were of Egyptian background, only those two. And so the older of them uh, was asked, well, what, what do you do in Egypt on Sabbath afternoon? <laughs> so the man said, <coughs> we, we chant from the Psalms. Okay, fine. So let's uh, go ahead and do it. So he turns to Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the entire Bible, and he begins to chant. And uh, finally, I think we were wondering, is he going to go through all, uh, you know, what is it, 176 uh, let me see, uh, 22 times 8. Hey, uh, is he going to go through all 176 verses? So at some point, uh, you know, uh, somebody s s stepped in and said, okay, moving right along, you know. But uh, Psalm 119 is really very impressive, and I'm going to say more about that in a moment. But I want to mention to you that God has a sense of humor, and some of you may have been involved in a situation similar to what I'm going to discuss. Obviously, not exactly the same, but similar. Uh, I've been on both ends of this kind of thing. Uh, here you have somebody coming to God and asking him, you know, what's your opinion of what the most important scriptures are? And then after God tells him, he says, well done, you know, like God needs his uh, approbation. So anyway, it, it, it's, it's very ironic and very humorous on that level. But let's, let's take a look at it. I want to uh, go over it in, in, uh, Matt, in Mark 12, uh, uh, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, uh, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all of the commandments is, you know, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Right? The hero Israel, the Lord, uh, our, uh, our God, the Lord is one, and you shall uh, love the Lord your God. Then he, was, then he quotes the fifth verse, you know, Deuteronomy 6, 4, then he goes to 6, 5. And you shall, that's the 6-4 is the introduction, in a sense, to 6-5. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. He kind of elaborates on the verse. And that's a whole, uh, that's a sermon for another day. Uh, this is the first commandment. And the second is like, uh, like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19-18. I believe this commandment is in the Bible more than any other. There is no other commandment greater than these. And then the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. Yeah, like he needs his, uh, his uh, you know, uh, confirmation. Anyway, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, uh, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And he waxes eloquent, but it's all true. And then, and so now when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Uh, but after that, no one dared question him. You know, he answered so well, and the fellow responded well, and so that, that, that ended that discussion. Uh, I'd like to now go to Matthew 19, and I'm going to begin around verse 16. And... Uh, here, somebody that whom Luke calls a, a ruler, a leader in the community. If you look at Luke 18, uh, you know, he's a, a leader in the community. Uh, but, but anyway, I want to read, look, take up the account in Matthew. 
uh, 19, and uh, I want to go to 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal, that I may have eternal life? I suspect that he had been getting some instruction and, and now wanted to really zero in uh, on the essence of, of what uh, Jesus' teaching uh, it was. So he said to him, Why do you call me good? There is no, no one good but, but, uh, but one, that is God. So, you know, this person, again, doesn't realize who, to whom he's speaking. Again, we have some irony here. Uh, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, it's interesting. As I said, he, he really wants to zero in. <laughs> so he said to him, which ones? So Jesus, in effect, summarizes the Ten Commandments, particularly the, the latter six that are human to human. And, and then he summarizes it with uh, Leviticus 19.18. Evidently, the Jews of that period uh, were very, very careful about the first four, but evidently in, in that society, there was a lot of violation of the last six. Uh, Jesus answered, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. So he, he, he gives them in, in a different order. He's rattling them off uh, in a sense, in, in effect, he's saying, you, you know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you know, you're a ruler of the people. Anyway, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? So evidently, he, he, uh, he, he, he from, from hanging around uh, Jesus and the disciples of Jesus, he understood that, that there was more to, to Jesus' teaching than simply keep the law. There's more to it. Uh, so Jesus said to him in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So he was unwilling to go all the way, at least at that point. So in effect, what he's telling him is, you need to have a relationship with me. You need to follow me. And in, in your case, I'm telling you to, you know, get rid, uh, sell, your, sell your possessions, give to the poor and follow me. And what a wonderful disciple that man would have made because he was a VIP in that, in that world. But anyway, the point is that you keep the commandments, but that's, of course, not enough. We have to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and we have to follow Jesus Christ. We have to be his disciples. In other words, to, in the generic sense, I'm not talking about an organization or a denomination, but in the in generic sense, we do have to be Christian commandment keepers. Now, if we go to the last prophet of the Old Testament, you know, the, we, we come to the time where we're going to have now around four centuries between the, the Testaments. And so we want to come to the final prophecy uh, 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 that's in the canon of the Old Testament. And that's, uh, of course, Malachi. He's the, the, the last of the, of the, uh, of the prophets of, 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 that, of, that, of the Hebrew and Aramaic scriptures. And uh, in the fourth chapter of, of, of uh, Malachi, in the fourth verse, 4-4, four, four, he says, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. So that's the final exhortation uh, of the prophecy, of the prophets of, of, the, of the Tanakh. The final exhortation is, remember the law of Moses, my servant, you know, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. So you can understand why, uh, you know, we have Psalm 119, which is an ode, you know, to the, to the commandments of God, the word of God. And there are various terms in that Psalm for God's commandments, for his instructions. And I have given talks on that in the past, and God willing, we'll do so again. And Psalm 119 is really... Uh, an elaboration of Psalm 19. And uh, if I have time in this message, I'll go back to Psalm 19. But uh, I would recommend you read it. There's one passage there that became 
uh, that, that even uh, President Abraham Lincoln in his second inaugural address uh, quoted from. But that is called the Psalm of David. But Psalm 119 uh, does not list an author. Uh, but I want to go to Psalm 119. And why are there 176 verses? <clears throat> well, you can figure it out because there are 22 distinct symbols that are used in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, it's true that there are five of them that have a special form at the end of a word, but there are in, uh, the way Jews organized their literature in ancient times, the way they used to do it, they had in mind 22 distinct symbols that were used for the Hebrew alphabet, 22, and uh, some passages in the Bible are organized alphabetically. You know, so A, B, C, I mean, in, in English we would say, you know, begin the first verse with A, next verse with B, next verse with C. And so we have that thing, we have that kind of organization in the Bible. There are seven acrostic psalms, and then there are five other passages in, uh, in uh, the four chapters of Lamentations and the woman of valor at the end of the book of Proverbs. So altogether we have 12 clearly acrostic passages. And so here we have eight verses in Psalm 119 beginning with Aleph. That's why in your Bible it says Aleph, and in some cases even shows an Aleph, <laughs> you know, the way they've been written for the last 2,500 years among the Jews. And so we have Aleph, and then we have eight verses beginning with Bet, and eight verses beginning with Gimel. Some of you know the Greek alphabet, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and so on. We, that's where we get the word alphabet because it comes from Aleph, Bet in Hebrew, which becomes Alpha, Beta, and then Aleph, you know, alphabet uh, in the, uh, as the language is developed. So anyway, we have here eight verses per psalm, for, or rather for letter, and altogether times 2276. And there's various ways to approach it. I want to talk about two aspects of it. Number one, you could say this is a thorough discussion of the Word of God, 176 verses, and it's organized alphabetically. It makes it easier to locate verses if you're looking for them, and easier to memorize uh, passages, and, and, and it, does, it gives an, a, a thorough, an exhaustive, let's say, discussion of the Word of God. But from another point of view, you could say, you could go on and on and on. So putting it in alpha, <coughs> excuse me, Putting it in alphabetical order is, is a limitation. It keeps you from just going on and on and on because you go from Aleph to Tav and then you finish. So you use the alphabet to, to limit your discussion so you don't just go you get out of control. You know, so both of those are, are a, a part of the acrostic concept. Are you with me? Uh, I want to go over some verses uh, in, in Psalm 119 with you uh, as, as part of this message. Now, I'm giving this message on January 20th of 2023 on the secular calendar. And 10 days ago was the anniversary. 247 years ago, a pamphlet was published, I believe 47 pages, which proportionately was the historic bestseller in U.S. history, I think to this day. And the author, uh, Thomas Paine, was originally going to call it Plain Truth. And uh, there was a pamphlet published by Benjamin Franklin in 1747 called Plain Truth. And so maybe he decided to go with that title under that influence. But he had a friend who was a, a, a leader of the American Revolution, Benjamin Rush, who advised him to, to title it Common Sense. So this pamphlet, Common Sense, was published in Philadelphia January 10th of 1776. And it became widespread and uh, help to uh, help to encourage uh, the the formation of an independent country here. We seceded, you know, from the British Empire. We Americans, uh, I wasn't here at the my ancestors weren't here yet at the time, but those who were seceded from the British Empire and became an independent country. Common sense. Well, I want to call this talk common sense. Common sense from a spiritual point of view. Now, I understand that when uh, Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense, not everybody agreed with him. So even though it was common sense, but evidently a third of the American public didn't agree with him. Uh, but uh, So it, it may be common sense in one way, maybe in another. Uh, it does require 
uh, profound spiritual insight to understand what I'm telling you today. But I do want to go to Matthew 5 uh, before I go to Psalm 119 and one more introductory passage, uh, and that's Matthew 5, uh, where Jesus says in verse 17, Think not that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, you know, not a not a stri not a not a a, a stripe or what, what, you know, a a line. What what, what how are you? Stroke. Ah, good. That's thank you. That's you. You have to have, have to have Linda here when I speak. Not a stroke or 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 a, a yud, a, a yota in Greek, a jot. You know, not a not a like a like a little a little apostrophe, not a stroke or or or, or a, a stem of a letter or the or the letter yud, the smallest of the letters. Uh, Till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe I should go on and read one one or two more verses. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, because there may be some that may not have quite the impact on society that others have, right? Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches them shall be called great uh, in the kingdom of heaven. I'll leave it there and go back now to Psalm 119. And I want to go to uh, the, the bet section and to, uh, and to verse 12. You know, uh, uh, Orthodox Judaism has very strict rules about when to use God's name. And uh, there are many, many occasions when blessings are to be recited. And, and sometimes you might begin a blessing and then realize uh, that, that you, you're making a mistake. You know, you're, you're, you didn't need to say the blessing or whatever. So in that case... You finish the blessing by simply reciting this verse, and that saves you from the sin in Orthodox Judaism of reciting a bracha levatala, a, a, a blessing in vain. So you start with Baruch Atah Adonai, blessed are you, O Lord, and then you don't remember what to do, so you say, Lamdeni Chukecha, teach me your statutes. So you've, written, you've said a scripture, and you haven't violated that principle. But I want to go to Psalm 119.12. He says, blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. You know, he wants to be taught, he wants to know God's law. Because that's that's the way of life, eternal life, as as Jesus say, uh, said in the New Testament. And verse eighteen is one of my favorite verses in in the entire Bible. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. That keeps happening to me. Uh, I'm grateful to still be alive and well because I'm still learning so much. And is there, <laughs> you, it, it, the, God's word is so profound. You you can never, of course. Uh, completely uh, understand what's here, but it, but it it just gets more and more interesting as old, the older I get. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things uh, from your law. I now want to go to um, the Zion section, and um, I think I want to go to, yes, verse 49. Uh, when I was in the yeshiva, uh, uh, Zichron Meir, uh, which is today located in Mountaindale, uh, New York, in the Catskill Mountains, uh, at that time we had a campus in Brooklyn, and then at times we went up to the mountains. Later on, the campus in Brooklyn was abandoned, and they just remained up in the mountains. But we, we were told that these verses, uh, Psalm 119, verse 49, 50, and 51, were, were sung by concentration camp inmates. You know, on their way to, on their way to extermination, they, they, they had faith, they had confidence that, you know, they were, they were on the right side. Ultimately, they were going to be the winners, even though they were, they were going to be martyred. Uh, here, I'm going to read these three verses and a little bit beyond. Uh, he, in, ver, in verse 49, Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your, uh, that your, for your word has given me life. The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. I'm continuing to read the passage. 
uh, beyond because I want to get to the next section. Indignation has taken hold of me because of the wicked who for forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. This has become mine because I, I kept your precepts. And it reminds me of Psalm 30, where, where you know, it says that, um, well, I'm going to go to Psalm 30. I hadn't actually planned to read those extra verses, but uh, it worked out well that I did, I think. But I want to go to Psalm 30, which kind of summarizes the thought there. Um and I, I mentioned the other day that th th this passage is one of the favorites that uh, President Obama used to often refer to. Uh, I want to go to uh, Psalm 30 and verse um, verse 5. It's talking about God. It says, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Uh, but I want to uh, go further and go to um, the mem section. Uh, so if you're in the letter mem, which is verse 97, Oh, how love I your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your, you through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. Uh, you, do have a, you do have a pressure from time to time if you're, if you're a, a commandment-keeping person. And there is also a spirit world that, that pulls people uh, negatively that we have to overcome. And he says, I have more understanding than all my teachers for your com testimonies are my meditation. It doesn't mean that I know more physics than they do or more Spanish grammar than they do uh, or whatever or, or, or more welding, <laughs> you know, more skill as a welder. But we have more understanding of just how to live than even the wisest uh, expert in one field or another. Uh, if we really are, uh, know the Bible well. And uh, while I'm on that subject, I do want to um, comment on uh, a, a talk show host a lot of you know. I saw him speak many, many years ago when I was at USC and talking, uh, talking about Dennis Prager. He has a commentary out called The Rational Bible. And now I don't, agree with, I don't agree with every word in there, but I would recommend it. Anyway, verse 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your, precept, your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I, I have not departed from your judgments for you, you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. As I said, this expands on thoughts you can read about in Psalm 19. If I have time, I'll go back there. If not, I'll recommend that Psalm to you. Uh, I want to go now to the next verse. This was like a, 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 a intro to the next verse. Verse 105, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So you can think of this world as in many ways in spiritual darkness and God's word as a lamp that leads us, you know, on, as Jesus said, to that straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life. Now this reminds me of a proverb that I want to turn to now. Proverbs 6 and verse 23. Proverbs 6 and verse 23. It's a similar thought. And uh, here it says in Proverbs 6, 23, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Now, I want you to, uh, if I may make this recommendation, that you join this with Romans 6.23. Proverbs 6.23 and Romans 6.23. That way you memorize two verses uh, for, the, you know, for the price of one. If you're doing a KFC commercial, more cluck for the buck. I want to go to Romans 6 and verse 23. I already read Proverbs 6.23. And in a moment, I'll finally get to Romans 6.23. A lot of you are already there because you're using a device instead of flipping pages in a book as, as I'm doing. Um, Okay, Romans 6 and verse uh, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, I want to now uh, go uh, to, um, to the uh, resh, uh, to the, uh, to the Tzadi uh, portion, uh, the letter Tzadi, uh, uh, which begins in 137, and I want to go to verse 42. 
It says, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. You remember Jesus Christ said, sanctify them by your your, your truth. Your word is truth, John 17, 17. So this is Psalm 119, 142. And uh, now I want to go to uh, the Resh section. I want to go to Psalm 119, verse 160. It says, Rosh Devarecha Emet. The beginning of your word is truth. Your word is true from the beginning. And uh, when Jesus Christ spoke of Genesis, he spoke of them as historical events. The book of Genesis is true. And uh, now I realize some people might argue the first 11 chapters are true from a spiritual point of view, but are intended to be allegorical. I do believe that they're historical. But in any case, they are, from, from a doctrinal point of view, authoritative. You know, but I, I do believe that they are historical, and I believe that the New Testament supports that view. And, and uh, I think Psalm 119, 160, in effect, supports that view. Now, I realize that it's translated differently in some Bibles because it depends on what the word Rosh means. Rosh means the head, and it could mean the beginning, but it could also mean the most essential characteristic, the chief. You know, here it says, the entirety of your word is truth. That's, that's the way the New King James translates it that I'm looking at. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. I'd like to go now to um, Psalm 161, not to the Sheen section, to verse uh, to uh, 164. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. So all through the day, in other words, all the, uh, the complete day, uh, all through the day, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, praising God because of his judgments. And you know, when, when you see a news article, or when you hear a story about this or that, you know, and you think, what what would the world be like if if uh, civilization were were really based on scripture? Now, to some degree, it is, and that's one reason for it, whatever stability it has had, and much of the good that has come from Western civilization is because of the influence of the Bible. But obviously, much more is needed. And frankly, right now, the Western civilization is in is in a steep decline because of abandoning of the scriptures. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. So if we have that positive commitment to God's law, we're going to keep on, on going, heading towards the, as I said, for, with eyes on the prize, you know. As Paul said, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to, to go all the way and, and, and obtain uh, salvation. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. I want to finish. I want to now go to Psalm one uh, seventy-two. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. So, God's commandments are, define define what righteousness is. Now, can you imagine that after all this, that uh, and all that God tells the children of Israel regarding their relationship with him, why the, why the punishments, why the exile, you know, uh, why, why Israel has, has had all the problems that it has had over the centuries. You know, he, he, he says, I need to get you back on track spiritually. You need to be a commandment-keeping nation. Well, after all that... It, it, now he's going to come and and uh, so to speak scrap it. You know that is that is that just didn't make any sense. The common sense would be that he would come as you, as Jesus said to fulfill. And in fact, he tightens uh, uh, many 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 of these of these laws. He he tells you, uh, for example, that if you if you lust. Uh, after uh, he, he tells you know uh, people if 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 you have sexual lust, it's as bad as as actually doing it because you've mentally done it. So he tightens up, and uh, in effect he fulfills Isaiah forty two verse twenty one. And uh, you know those of you who grew up in the synagogue would know this verse. It's part of the liturgy, but I want to go to Isaiah forty two and verse twenty one. Now it is true that that in some ways the Pharisees had 
had made the the uh, the law burdensome with their traditions, and he he was loosening up on that. You know, he he emphasized the spirit over the letter, and he also said that the Pharisees had had added a lot that wasn't necessary. You know, he and he broke some of their he broke, <coughs> pardon me, some of their some of their traditions to indicate that you know let's stick with the Bible and not just keep piling on do's and don'ts of our own uh, you know construction. Uh, but in verse uh, 21 of Isaiah 42, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. Now when you come to the end of the story, you come to the book of Revelation and you see the church of God described. And unfortunately it is persecuted in the end time, but it winds up of course winning, you know. Uh, you know, you read the end of the book and the church wins, Jesus Christ returns and the church wins. But in the meantime there's trouble for the church. And so in, in Revelation 12:17 uh, let's go to the 17th verse. Um, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. How are they defined? Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a central figure in God's plan of salvation. I pick up tidbits from all kinds of people with whom I may have serious disagreements. The other day, I saw a, a Messianic Jewish preacher who pointed out something interesting. The first word of the Bible is bet, but a sheet, in the beginning. And the last word in the entire Bible is nun. Because if you go to the book of Revelation, how does it end? It ends with the word amen. Now that, and that's written in Greek, but, but it's a Hebrew word. And if you go back to the to the Hebrew word Amen, it ends with Nun. Uh, okay, are you with me? So, if you um, if you take Bet and Nun, you know the Bible begins with Bet and ends with Nun. You have the word Ben in Hebrew, which means son. <laughs> you know, so in many ways, the Son of God is the central, of course, the central character in the Bible. I often call him, when I speak of the holy days in Leviticus 23, mm -hmm. I often speak of him as the hero of the holy days. So we need to have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And if you go to Revelation 19.10, that's defined. Uh, John sees an angelic being, and he's, he, he, he has a sense of wanting to worship the being, and then the, person, and the being says no, that you just worship God. Uh, let me go to Revelation 19.10. Um, and I fell at his feet to worship him, Revelation 19.10, but he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brothers who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the very essence of inspired preaching, it, it, you know, it, it centers around the role of Jesus Christ in God's plan of salvation. Prophecy, in effect, all prophecy ultimately points to that. The, G, the role of Jesus Christ in God's plan of salvation. So obviously we need to have an understanding of that, of Jesus Christ and his role in God's plan of salvation in order to be saved. And of course, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Matthew 24, 13. Salvation is what ultimately happens uh, it's it, 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 we're on on hopefully on the road to salvation, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Matthew twenty four thirteen. And I want to go to uh, Revelation fourteen and verse twelve. And you know where I'm going, many of you. Uh, Revelation fourteen and verse twelve. Um, Here is the patience of the saints. Oh, who are the saints? <clears throat> Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God has created the universe. God has created human beings. He has a, poten a, a, a potential in store for us beyond our, our wildest dreams. He wants to share eternity with us. He wants us to be uh, become ultimately spirit beings, his sons and daughters. So knowing that, he has a right 
to uh, be involve himself in our uh, diet, diet, in our sex life, in the way we speak, uh, in the way we work, etc., etc. You know, he has a way of life, uh, and he has inspired writings so that we don't have to be in doubt. You know, I'm sure there are going to be gray areas so that we can exercise wisdom and learn to tolerate one another when we have differences. But there is a basic way of life that it, that is revealed in the scriptures that we can, you know, study and, and, and we can come more and more to obey. And as we obey, of course, we come to understand more and more. So ultimately, I, I'm not talking about the name of an organization or a denomination. I'm talking about a, g a generic category. We need to be Christian commandment keepers. That's just spiritually speaking, common sense. All the best to you and yours.